Okay, what does that say? Yep, part one. But first, I want to say thank you to Brother Tony for inviting us out. I've known him longer than I've known dirt. <laughs> no, I met Tony years ago. I don't know if he t told you the story, but I didn't met him years ago in Pensacola, Florida at a conference down there. I think it was 98. I think it was. But uh, what a wonderful brother he's been to me. Just so encouraging. And uh, um, I met another guy named Bruce Morgan. Goodness gracious. <laughs> that guy has been... He, he is Bruce Morgan, for those of you who know him, uh, he probably called me once every three to six months uh, and, until the end of his life. And uh, I've never met such profoundly grateful men who have stuck with the scriptures over tradition and who haven't been afraid to follow Jesus Christ, come what may. And so what a blessing that y'all have to have Tony as your teacher here at Prospect Baptist Church. Uh, you know, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna use these glasses so I can see y'all. <laughs> well, um, in my own studies of the kingdom of God, um, I have found, well, I came to see the kingdom of God in 1993 after a lot of fear and, uh, you know, it's kind of scary when you go against tradition. I was raised a dispensationalist, for those of you who know the term. Anyway, I was raised one of those guys who believed that, you know, we were going to be raptured, disappear, to drop a bat, and then a bunch of people be left on the earth and go through this horrible time, seven-year tribulation period, and then a millennial kingdom. And it was very, very convoluted. Uh, but I tried my best to explain it to people. <laughs> and uh, then the more and more... I began to look at the scriptures. I was actually going through the book of Kings and uh, was taking our church through a study of the book of Kings. And one of the older prophets is a dude by the name of Hosea. Say it with me, Hosea. He's a prophet. And uh, in, in his prophecy, in one of his prophecies, he says, there they shall be called the sons of God. In this messianic kingdom, I thought, wow, that's so cool. Because I remember that, for, uh, John 1.12 says, uh, as many as received him, to them gave he the right to become the children of God, that is to those who believe on his name. And then of course, 1 John says, beloved, now are we the sons of God. So I thought, man, that is so neat. And once I saw that, I realized, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something that, uh, that I hadn't seen done before. But I'm going to go through the kings and I'm going to look at all of the prophets, the contemporary prophets of each king, whether they're a good king or a bad king, right? I wanted to look at all those prophets. And it was in my studies of the book of Isaiah that I realized that I had been placing, along with C.I. Schofield and the telescopic model, for those of you who don't know, uh, there was this idea of prophecy and I was taught this growing up, and it was, it was, it's really prominent in the Dallas Theological Seminary. It's the telescopic theory. And what it, the theory says is this. You have these two mountains, right, that when you're far away from them, they look kind of close. And then as you get closer to the mountains, they appear to be farther apart. Well, that was their idea of interpreting prophecy. So essentially what they were saying is this. The prophets were mistaken. They saw what appeared to be two mountains that were very close together. But then we, in all of our 20th century wisdom, were able to figure out, oh, they weren't as close together as they thought. So when you start picking apart the prophets like that, or anyone, whether it's the prophets or the apostles or any of the New Testament writers or Jesus himself, when you start picking apart their words and uh, questioning the veracity of what they say or the accuracy of what they say, really what you're doing is you're questioning the Bible. If you said that the prophets were wrong, well, they were wrong about those two mountains, namely the cross and the kingdom. So what C.I. Schofield and the telescopic model, in other words, you, you know, telescope, what they said was, well, these mountains of the cross and the kingdom were actually 
thousands of years apart. And the reason they said that they were thousands of years apart is because the Jews rejected God's first plan and he had to resort to plan B. Bummer for God, right? I mean, think about it. We, we say that we believe in a sovereign God. We say that we believe that God has a plan, but because of those darn stubborn Jews, he had to resort to plan B. You see what I mean? There's a problem with that. Well, when I got to the book of Isaiah, I started to see that there was no gap in between these references which talk so wonderfully about the cross of Jesus and that also talk about the kingdom of God. And I want to run something by you. You remember Isaiah 53, right? Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He shall grow up before him and all that. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, right? We hid as it were our faces from him. We did not esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. All we like sheep have gone astray, right? We know the passage. But if you look through the entirety of Isaiah 53, in the original, remember, there are no chapter breaks. It goes straight into Isaiah 54, which talks about the barren woman rejoicing. Remember that? Well, Galatians, Paul says, is saying that that's fulfilled in the church. Isaiah 54. So Isaiah 53 is about the cross. Isaiah 54 is all about the kingdom. But we should just erase that chapter break and put them all together. So the title of this message is called Connecting the Cross and the Crown. I don't believe there's any separation. I really don't. Jesus came to bring in his kingdom. And according, as we'll see later, Acts chapter 13, it is through Christ's cross and resurrection that he fulfilled all that was promised to the fathers and the prophets. Amen? So let's take a look at this. Connecting the cross and the crown. This is part one. There's a little best thing I could find on Pinterest, right? It's a cross and a crown linked together. Can you all see that okay? Upper right-hand corner? Okay. If you can't, I'll just carry the TV closer to you. So you can... <laughs> All right, if the prophets unite the cross and crown in the context of the prophesied kingdom, then we should not interrupt that context. And it's a big deal. Either the kingdom has come or it hasn't, right? If the kingdom hasn't come, well, man, we are way different. We are way different than those out there who are saying that it is yet in the future, okay? I don't believe we should disrupt any biblical context which associates the cross and kingdom of God. And this one right here is the best. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 and 7, for to us a child is born, the famous Christmas text. To us the son is given, and then two or three thousand years later, the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Does anybody see a problem with that one? <laughs> wrong, right? That's totally wrong. <laughs> that two or three thousand years later is not in the original Hebrew. <laughs> Let's look at it, what the Bible actually says. This is beautiful. I mean, we, you know, how many of you uh, like the Messiah, Handel's Messiah? Remember that? For unto us a child is given. Remember that? Born unto us. It's a beautiful song. We know it, we've memorized it, we read it just about every Christmas time. But what is it telling us? There is no gap. Do you see a gap in there? Unto us a child is born, Jesus, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Do you believe that the government is on his shoulder, amen? I do, by the grace of God. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Well, that's a big question. When we look at the media, we see all the things that are going on, and you know, like modern day Gog and Mega. No, I'm just kidding. Remember that? You remember all that? They used to tell us that the Russia or something was Gog and Magog and 
having nothing to do with the Bible whatsoever. But we look around and we think, how could this be it? Well, what we need to make clear to people is this is not it. This terra firma, this planet Earth is not the kingdom of God. Jesus said, behold, the kingdom of God is within you or among you. It does not come with observation. Paul was praying that Christ in Ephesians chapter 3, he says he was praying that Christ would dwell in their hearts by faith. Second Peter speaks about them longing for the day star to arise in their hearts. That's Jesus. So when we look around and we see things and we ask questions like, well, how can you say this is the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God has come when there's so much war and turmoil and there's divorce and, and, and kids are alienated from their parents and their problems and fighting and Antifa and white nationalists and all this stuff. How can you say that the kingdom of God has come? What is the peace? Jesus said it very clearly. My peace, I give you what? Not as the world gives. In other words, our idea of peace is like the people's idea of hunger in John chapter 6. What did Jesus say? You follow me because what? Your bellies were filled. Remember the 10 lepers? How many came back to give Jesus glory? Just one. People knew he could do miracles. So they went to him for healing, but they never trusted in him. As Tony so wonderfully said, they never ate his flesh and drank his blood. They never relied on him as soul and sovereign savior. What is this peace? Romans 5 verse 1. Therefore being what? What's it say over there? Justified, rendered innocent is what that means. You are rendered innocent in the sight of Jesus. Therefore, being justified by faith, say it with me. We have peace with God. That was the peace for which all of the prophets were longing. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Of his, there is no end to the increase of his government and peace. In other words, people continue to enter into the gates of the city. You ever wonder about that? I remember I always used to wonder that in Revelation 21 when I was a futurist. I was like, okay, if all the righteous are saved in heaven and all the unrighteous are damned in hell, well, who are these people that keep coming in through the gates? Didn't you guys ever wonder that? No? <laughs> I guess I'm alone in that. I don't know. It just kind of freaked me out. I'm like, man, where are they coming from? S suckers, they shouldn't be there. <laughs> right? Well, the Bible says that Christ is the wisdom and power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, Proverbs 8, a beautiful prophetic passage. It says, wisdom what? Cries at the gates of the city. That's the gospel cry. Come on in. Come on in and enter the gates of the city. The Bible says we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem. That's a good one to always ask people, right? You ask people the que these questions, right? They're kind of, a, oh, you know, when we ask questions, they're designed to sort of trap people, <laughs> right? We do it, but we, we, we want to do it in grace and mercy. But I ask them the question, do you believe you've come to the heavenly Jerusalem? And I'll say, well, no. Huh, that's audacious, right? Oh, turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 22, <laughs> right? You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God, to Mount Zion, right? And then this is a good one, too. So have you come to the spirits of just men made perfect and an innumerable company of angels? Well, of course not. Same verse, same passage. You have come to an innumerable company of angels and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Did you know that we're with angels right now? <laughs> Some of you are going, what? Ah! <laughs> no, seriously, that's what the Bible says. We are in the presence of Jesus and the holiest of all. What did, what's Jesus called in Romans 3, 25? Whom God, remember it said, for all have sinned, come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a what? What is it? Mercy seat. Mercy seat. 
And I've shared this before, but the Greek word for mercy seat is hilasmos. And it's where we get our word hilarious. Jesus is said to be our hilarious. You go, what? Well, Jesus is called the bread of life. And in the Old Testament, you had this, this bread called the showbread. And the word showbread in the King James Version, show means a turning of the face. Under the Old Testament, Isaiah 59 says, he had hidden his face from them. He couldn't look upon them because no sacrifice had been made for forgiveness of sins yet. But the Bible says that Jesus is our mercy seat. And remember the old benediction, the Lord caused his face to shine upon you, right? By Christ's sacrifice, God now looks at us through the mercy seat. What did God say to Aaron? It is over that mercy seat that I will what? Commune with you. Isn't that beautiful? We're in communion with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's so beautiful about this message we're teaching. We're not just teaching it happened. We're teaching what is your standing before God right now? We're trying to encourage believers and let them know that you are in the presence of Jesus. You are at the mercy seat. Mercy triumphs over judgment. That's why the mercy seat is above the ark, right? It symbolizes that mercy triumphs over judgment. And yet if you're anything like me or had any kind of an upbringing like I did, you experienced a lot of judgment and you probably did a lot of judging, right? In other words, for us oftentimes, judgment triumphs over mercy. But what did Jesus say? Go learn what this means. I want mercy and not sacrifice. Micah chapter seven says, God delights in mercy. I always like to share this with people. God isn't sitting there saying, mm, Tommy, I'm gonna have mercy on you, but uh, it's hard to do. No, it says God delights in mercy. He's looking at even Tommy and saying, man, I love being merciful to you. That's our God, right? I love being merciful to you. And so what did God say to us in Micah chapter six? He has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you to do justly and do what? Love mercy. He didn't say, try really hard to give it because you know how hard it is to give mercy to those sinners, right? No, he says, love mercy. When was the last time someone really, really offended you? You're like, man, I can't wait to have mercy on them. Right? Man, that's God. I can't wait to have mercy on them. And he gave it to us and he was excited about it. And all he says is, I want you to do the same to my people. That's peace. Ephesians chapter two, verse 14. Is there peace? Well, the Bible says, for he, Jesus, is our peace. Amen? He is our peace. He's made of both one. He's talking about Jew and Gentile. So if you're saying, well, there's no peace. No, Jesus says, for all of his children, there is peace. They're one. So we have, as we saw in the verse before, peace with God and peace with one another. Man, talk about communion. Amen? That's koinonia. And then there's John 14, which I quoted earlier. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. So when the world thinks about peace, when futurists think about peace, they're always thinking, ah, there's going to come a day when they won't learn war anymore, right? They shall be beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That is fulfilled. That's what we have in Jesus Christ. There's no more war. In fact, Isaiah 40, the Bible says this, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. Cry unto her that her what? Say it, Tony. Her warfare is over and that what? Her iniquity is pardoned. Do you see that? In other words, God associates warfare and its, its dissolution with the pardoning of iniquity. When our sins were forgiven by the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross, the warfare was done. The warfare was over. 
That's why it's so cool in Isaiah chapter 33, the very last verse of Isaiah 33, you know what it says? Beautiful prophetic context about the messianic kingdom, what Jesus would do. It says, the inhabitant of the land will not say, I'm sick, for they shall be forgiven of their iniquity. Isn't that great? That's Psalm 103. He heals all your diseases. The Bible says we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. It's talking about sin. We're totally healed in the eyes of God. You say, but wait a minute. I just screwed up last night. You're totally healed in the eyes of God. Amen? Can you imagine if every time you screwed up, you were kicked out of his presence? Oh, my goodness. We'd be kicked out about 5,000 times a day. Going in and out and in and out, right? (laughs) God says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Hallelujah. Here's another text. I always love these Christmas texts, right? Because these are the ones we read all the time. And that's a, good, that's a good way. It's what we call an apologetic. All it means is a way of talking to people to show forth God's goodness and his grace. Okay? We talk to people. We figure out how can we explain this in a way that they can understand, not in this weird lofty language that they're all just going, huh? <laughs> you know, what does that mean? Give them stuff they understand, that they love, that they're familiar with, right? And then work from there. Rejoice greatly. We read it Christmas time. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious. Make riding on an ass. (laughs) Do you see how how, uh, uh, dichotomous that seemed, that might have seemed to those people? What? This is the fulfillment of Zechariah? This dude's sitting on an ass. Victorious, righteous, king. We're supposed to shout over this, right? Matthew 21 says this is fulfilled. Whether we like it or not, Matthew says it's fulfilled. Jesus has fulfilled this. So now watch the context. So we agree, this is Palm Sunday, right? (laughs) In this little text here. Behold, your king comes to you. He's righteous, victorious, meek, riding on an ass, even a colt, the son of an ass, and then watch, 2,000 years later? No, he says, and I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. And the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. That's Ephesians 2. That's Ephesians chapter 2, what we just read. He's made of the two, Gentiles. That's the Greek word for nations, right? The Greek word for nations is ethnos. That's translated as Gentiles or heathen, ethnos. Anything other than the Jews. He has spoken peace to the nations. We are the nations. Jesus is our peace. And his dominion, ah, so is Jesus ruling? Well, first of all, I just appeal to a verse, 2 Timothy. He says this, actually, I'd be first, think a second. He says, now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever, amen? Now, aren't you glad I didn't say then? (laughs) He says, now unto the king eternal. His dominion shall be from sea to sea. Whenever you see, in in most of the prophecies, whenever you see that word sea, S-E-A, it's referring to the Gentiles. And that's why in Isaiah chapter 60, it says, an abundance, the abundance of the sea shall be converted to you. He's talking to Israel. Arise, shine, for your light has come. Remember that, beautiful. And so Christ is the light. And Gentiles, remember what Simeon said when he held up the Christ child? He says, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. Mine eyes have seen your salvation. He says, the glory of your people Israel and a light to lighten the nations. Simeon said that, Luke chapter 2. So when you think to yourself about this dominion, It has to get personal. 
Because every single one of us in this room has struggles. We have our struggles. We have our addictions. Right? Every single one of us. I'll be the first to tell you, I still struggle with addictions. I don't like it. And at times it's debilitating. It makes me feel like I'm not a Christian. It makes me feel unsaved. It makes me feel like God has left me. But every single person is struggling with some sort of addiction. And if you think to yourself that addiction has to be substance or alcohol or pornography, think again. Addiction can be gambling. It can be gossiping. Right? Boy, that's a heavy one. That might be the greatest addiction that Christians battle with, is gossiping, slander. So it doesn't feel like God is reigning and victorious in our lives. We don't feel triumphant, right? And here Paul says this. Can you imagine what these Corinthians were thinking to themselves? Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ Jesus. I don't always feel triumphant. What's the key phrase? He always causes us to triumph what? In Christ Jesus. He always sees you as in Christ Jesus in spite of our repeated failures. What kind of grace is that? So I get this all the time. So you just believe you can do anything you want. I'm like, I don't think you're looking at this through the same glasses. I always tell people this analogy. If someone came up to you and you had hurt them, you had offended them, and you were totally in debt and your house was going to go into foreclosure, you couldn't pay it, and this person that you had hurt comes up, steps up to the plate and says, I'm going to cover that for you. I'm going to cover this month's payment. And you know what? I think I'm just going to pay off the whole loan. And you're sitting there going, good, I want to slap you in the face. That's antithetical, isn't it? It makes no sense. You see, God has changed our heart. It doesn't mean we won't struggle with our addictions, our problems, our vices, whatever they are. We hate it. We despise it. But God's sitting there saying, you're still my children. Life's going to kind of suck for you. When you disobey me, it, 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 it hurts you but I love you. I mean, I always ask people the question, you know, these people who believe we can lose our salvation. I'm like, wow, you know, God has adopted us. He took the time to adopt us, according to Ephesians, to adopt us as his children. Now imagine if you had adopted someone, you had adopted a child as your own, and that child was really, really disobedient. You know, ah, I got to disown you, sucker, sorry. <laughs> What a drag, right? I know a girl in, in Colorado. Her dad was a, uh, a mega church pastor. And it was a, a Pentecostal assembly. And this girl, I, I, I'd shown her grace, shown her what the Bible teaches about grace, because in her particular tradition, she had not known grace. She had known a very works-based salvation. And I'd shown her grace. And it turned out she was a high-end escort. I, I think we see one of those in John 8. We may, we may see one of those in Luke 7. I always ask people this question. When you watch TV or the media and you hear about some horrible serial killer or a rapist or a pedophile or a, a, a murderer, or a, a genocidal maniac, is your first thought, how could he? Right? Or is your first thought, wow, Lord, thank you for rescuing me. That's me. What then, Paul says, are we better than they? In no wise. We before proved both Jew and Gentile. They're all under sin, amen? By the grace of God. He takes us from that place of being slaves to sin and he sets our feet on a high place 
And he says, you're forgiven. It's forgotten. You know, we throw out that phrase, right? Forgiven and forgotten. Well, really in us, we're kind of like, well, I kind of still stored it up here in this little, you know, thumb drive. You know what God says about your sins in Hebrews chapter eight and 10? He says in the new covenant, he says, their sins and their iniquities, what? I Say it louder. I will remember them no more. Isn't that beautiful? He forgot the sin you're going to do tonight. Just contemplate that. That doesn't make you want to disobey him. That makes you want to thank him. He knows you're going to do that. He knows the thoughts you're going to have. How many of you have had wayward thoughts even this morning? Anyone? (laughs) I've had about 672. There's a one. No, it's probably three. 673. We have these thoughts. Jesus didn't just, he died for our thoughts. That was the problem. But he says, thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph. You're always triumphant. If you fall on your face, if you get a DUI, if you're in prison, if you kill a family of four, God forbid, but you're in prison and you're locked up for the rest of your life. God says, you're holy and blameless in my eyes. You're one of my children. I will never de-adopt you. He makes manifest the savor of his knowledge in every place. Why? Because you're demonstrating the light and grace and mercy of God. That's what we do as children of God. Revelation 6 verse 2, look at this dominion. I saw, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. You say, is that fulfilled? He went forth conquering and to conquer. Is that fulfilled? Well, my Bible says this. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen? The victory is in the blood of Christ. We sing it. Victory in Jesus But I think some of us are living these lives of cognitive dissonance, where it's like, I believe I have the victory, but I don't feel it. Of course you don't feel it all the time. The Bible says he's given us his righteousness. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21. He's given us his righteousness. He took our sin and he's given us his righteousness. Do you always feel righteous? No. Ernie, do you always feel righteous? No. Did your dad always feel righteous? Of course he didn't. That was one of the most beautiful things I experienced with Bruce. We'd talk on the phone. We didn't just talk about all this weird cerebral terminology and preterism and all this stuff. Man, Bruce and I would get on the phone and we'd talk about our junk. And at the end of the conversation, we're just thanking God for the cross. Man, that was beautiful. More than conquerors. Second Corinthians chapter 10. You say, you say, I but I I feel like I'm losing the battle. I feel like I'm losing the battle. Look at this. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. You see, modern day dispensationalism is very committed to military might, just like the Pharisees. We want dominion. We want to conquer Putin. We want to conquer all them Chinese. We are God-blessed America because we have nukes. You know what the Bible says? He says the Lord takes no pleasure in the legs of a horse. (laughs) Right? It's not, you know, horses. That, 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 that was their military standard, horses. Yeah, that's their tank. I mean, the whole reason God whittled it down to 300 men with Gideon is, is God saying, look, I don't work along your standards. I don't do that. In fact, God's the very opposite of that. And I think one of the greatest atrocities and idolatries that we have committed within Christendom is this total dependence on our military. 
This total dependence on our military to bring in the kingdom of God. We need to get out of that. God is not dealing in those categories. The victory is in Christ. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. That doesn't mean we don't pray for our nation. That doesn't mean we're not thankful that we have the freedom to preach the gospel and to meet like this. And we don't have to, at least at this juncture, worry about persecution. And man, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What's the stronghold? The stronghold is this idea that we can save ourselves. This idea that my good works will be acceptable in the sight of God and that he'll let me into his presence if I'm a good boy. (laughs) Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Get rid of those ideas that we can save ourselves and just rest. What did Jesus say? Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. The Bible says, we which have believed have entered into his rest. We are living in the Sabbath every day. Christ is our rest. I'll try to finish up here quick. Daniel 9, here's another one. Let's try and find our gap, our 2,000 year gap. I can't find one here. 70 weeks are decreed as to your people and to the holy city to finish transgression, right? To finish the transgression and make an end of sins. That's what Hebrews chapter 9 says. Christ appeared once in the end of the age to cancel sin by the sacrifice of himself. He canceled sin and to make atonement for iniquity. That word atonement simply means, that's hilarious, that's halasmos, right? That's the Greek translation of it. It's that sacrifice that made God smile upon you. That's what atonement actually means. It made God smile, showbread, turned his face toward you, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's the righteousness we have in Jesus. And to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Luke chapter 4, the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, Jesus. It was found where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because of this, he has anointed me. Christ is king. He's been anointed as both king and high priest. And back then, it was pretty much one or the other. Remember that one, that one king, Uzziah? He tried to do both. Remember that? He's like, well, I'm king, but I think I'll go into the holiest of all. (laughs) And what happened to his hand, do you remember? He was turned into a leper. (laughs) He got in there, he's, you know, diddle-daddling with all this stuff, and, and he touched something. And the Bible says he came out of there a leper forever, for the rest of his life. Well, Jesus is the permanent king, anointed as king, and the high priest forever. The Bible says He ever lives for us to pray for us. He has anointed me, Jesus says, to proclaim the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim deliverance to the captives. That's slavery to sin. It had nothing to do with people in dungeons, right? And new sight to the blind. We just said, Lord, you just played it beautifully. Amazing grace. I once was blind, but now I see. That's the type of blindness we're dealing with. To set at liberty, the Bible says, stand fast, Galatians 5.1, stand fast in the liberty with which Christ has made you free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. That's slavery, believing we could justify ourselves by our works. That's just gross. That's so gross. Paul called it poop. (laughs) No, he did. (laughs) Did he just say poop in the pulpit? (laughs) He called it poop. And of course, we know Isaiah chapter 64, what did he call our righteousnesses? Yeah, what does that word filthy mean? Minstrel. Why does God get so graphic? Why does he call our righteousness poop and minstrel rags? Anyone want to take a stab at that one? Because that's how he sees it. He sees all of our righteous deeds trying to make him accept us by our good deeds. He says, it's poop and menstrual rags. What a joy to be set at liberty from that. That's why Paul, 
man, he was a he was a lawyer of lawyers, a Hebrew of Hebrews, zealous more than all than his contemporaries. And he said, all those things that were gained to me, I count them as poop. That's what he said. So here's Jesus saying, Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to set at liberty. Stand fast in that liberty. Those having been crushed. That's that broken and contrite spirit, Isaiah 57, right? He says, thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. With this one will I dwell. Him who is of a broken and contrite spirit. It's when we say, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I can't save myself. I trust only in Jesus. Amen? I trust only in the cross. I have nothing. Nothing in my hands I bring, what? Simply to thy cross I cling. That's it. And rolling up the book, returning it to the attendant, he sat down, we say, is this fulfilled? And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fastened to him, and he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your ears. Amen? We're, we're, we're set at liberty. We're free. We're in the presence of Jesus, in the holy place, dwelling safely. A beautiful passage in John 10. It says to the one who comes to Jesus, it says he says he goes in through this gate. Jesus calls himself the door, right? And he says, we go in through this gate and then out into this pasture. We're, we're grazing. We're continually feasting on the riches of his grace. There's nothing greater. I'll finish up with this verse in Psalm 145. It's my favorite kingdom passage in Psalms where it says, they shall talk of his kingdom and speak of his power and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. That's what we do today. We revel in this magnificent grace that God has given us. We sing about it, we enjoy it, and we don't just believe it, we actually practice grace and mercy. When our brother and sister comes to us and they've fallen flat on their face, is our first response, well, you must not be a Christian. You must be unsaved. I can't believe you would do that again. <laughs> Mom's like, well, son, you've done it again and again and again and again, <laughs> right? I mean, man, if any of you have loving parents and have experienced parents who have been so forgiving, you know what that's like to have received mercy. Two greatest experiences in this world for a Christian is being grateful for being forgiven and forgiving with your whole heart. If you've ever had that opportunity to forgive someone, it feels so beautiful, doesn't it? Man, I know I've been forgiven more times than I've had the opportunity to forgive, but both of them are the greatest feeling in the world.